starting now. Black Clock Audio Tales, May 2019, Hawaiian Folklore and Legends, edited by Daniel Spitzer, music by Kevin McLeod. Help the show by sharing, rating, liking, or five-star giving wherever you listen to or rate podcasts. Support the show by hitting the patron button on pgttcm.podbean.com or by going to paypal.me slash pgttcm. And don't forget to visit pgttcm.com. Brought to you by bunnyslippers.com. Check out their new Dino Sound Slippers. Is that the name? They roar every third step. Very cool. Chikalakawa. Hawaiian Legends. Introduction. Part 3. Ancient Hawaiian Government. Previous to the 11th century, the several habitable islands of the Hawaiian group were governed by one or more independent chiefs, as already stated. After the migratory influx of that period, however, and the settlement on the islands of a number of warlike southern chiefs and their followers, the independent chiefs began to unite for mutual protection. This involved the necessity of a supreme head, which was usually found in the chief conceded to be the most powerful, and thus Ali Nuis, Moys and Kings, sprang into existence. So far as tradition extends, however, certain lines, such as the Mawiki, Pili, and Paumakua families, were always considered to be of supreme blood. They came to the islands as chiefs of distinguished lineage, and so remained. Gradually, the powers of the Moys and ruling chiefs were enlarged, until at length they claimed almost everything. Then the chiefs held their possessions in fief to the Moy, and forfeited them by rebellion. In time, the king became absolute master of the most of the soil over which he ruled, and assumed taboo rights, which rendered his person sacred and his prerogatives more secure. All he acquired by conquest was his, and by partitioning the lands among his titled friends, he secured the support necessary to his maintenance in power. Certain lands were inalienable, both in chiefly families and the priesthood. They were made so by early sovereign decrees, which continued to be respected. But with each succeeding king, important land changes usually occurred. Although the king maintained fish ponds and cultivated lands of his own, he was largely supported by his subject chiefs. They were expected to contribute to him whatever was demanded, either of food, raiment, houses, canoes, weapons or labour, and in turn they took such portions of their products of their tenants as their necessities required. The Ili was the smallest political division. Next above it was the Ahapua, which paid a nominal or special tax of one hog monthly to the king. Next, the Okana, embracing several Ahapuas, and finally the Moku, or district, or island. The labouring classes possessed no realty of their own, nor could they anywhere escape the claim or jurisdiction of a chief or landlord. They owed military and other personal service to their respective chiefs, and the chiefs owed theirs to the king. If required, all were expected to respond to a call to the field, fully armed and prepared for battle. Case rules of dress, ornamentation and social forms were rigidly enforced. The entire people were divided into four general classes. First, the Ali, or chiefly families, of various grades and prerogatives. Second, the Kahunas, embracing priests, prophets, doctors, diviners and astrologers. Third, the Kanakawali, or free private citizens. And fourth, the Kawa Maoli, or slaves, either captured in war or born of slave parents. The laws were few and simple, and the most of them referred to the rights and prerogatives of the king, priesthood and nobility. Property disputes of the masses were settled by their chiefs, and other grievances were in most instances left to private redress, which frequently and very naturally resulted in prolonged and fatal family feuds, and in the end requiring chiefly and sometimes royal intervention. This, in brief and very general terms, was the prevailing character of the government and land tenure throughout the several islands of the group 
until after the death of Kamehameha I in 1819 and the relinquishment by the crown of its ancient and sovereign rights in the soil. The leading chiefs and high priesthood claimed a lineage distinct from that of the masses and traced their ancestry back to Kumuhonua, the Polynesian Adam. The Ikupau, a sacred class of the supreme priesthood, assumed to be the direct descendants from the godhead, while the Ikunu were a collateral branch of the sacred and royal strain and possessed only temporal powers. It was thus that one of the families of the Hawaiian priesthood, in charge of the verbal genealogical records, exalted itself in sanctity above the political rulers. Proud of their lineage to guard against imposture and keep their blood uncorrupted, the chiefs allowed their claims to family distinction to be passed upon by a college of heraldry established by an early moi of Maui. Reciting their genealogies before the college, composed of alliés of accepted rank, and receiving the recognition of the council, chiefs were then regarded as members of the grade of aha alli, or chiefs of admitted and irrevocable rank. The chiefs inherited their titles and taboo privileges quite as frequently through the rank of one parent as of the other. As Hawaiian women of distinction usually had more than one husband, and the chiefs were seldom content with a single wife, the difficulty of determining the rights and ranks of their children was by no means easy. But the averment of the mother was generally accepted as conclusive and sufficient evidence in that regard. For political purposes, marriage alliances were common between the royal and chiefly families of the several islands, and thus, in time, the superior nobility of the entire group became connected by ties of blood. The political or principal wife of a king or distinguished chief was usually of a rank equal to that of her husband, and their marriage was proclaimed by heralds and celebrated with befitting ceremonies. Other wives were taken by simple agreement and without ceremony or public announcement. Very much in the same manner, the masses entered into their marriage unions. With the latter, however, polygamy was not common. When husband and wife separated, as they frequently did, each was at liberty to select another partner. The political wife of a chief was called Wahini Hua, the others Haya Wahini, or concubine. In the royal families, to subserve purposes of state, father and daughter, brother and sister, and uncle and niece frequently united as man and wife. The children of such unions were esteemed of the highest rank, and, strange to say, no mental or physical deterioration seemed to result from these incestuous relations, for all through the past the moys and nobles of the group were noted for their gigantic proportions. There were five or more grades of chiefs connected with the royal lines. First in order, and the most sacred, was the Alii Niaupio, the offspring of a prince with his own sister. Next, the Alii Pio, the offspring of a prince with his own niece. Next, the Alii Naha, the offspring of a prince or king with his own daughter. Next, the Alii Wohu, the offspring of either of the foregoing with another chiefly branch. And next, the Lo Ali, chiefs of royal blood. Any of these might be either male or female. To these grades of chiefs, distinct personal taboos or prerogatives were attached, such as the Tabu Moe, Tabu Wela, Tabu Hoanu, and Tabu Wohi. These taboos could be given or bequeathed to others by their possessors, but could not be multiplied by transmission. The meles, or ancestral chants of a family, passed in succession to the legal representatives and became exclusively theirs. But the government, taboos, and household gods of the king were subject to his disposal as he willed, either at his death or before it. The child of a taboo chief, born of a mother of lower rank, could not, according to custom, assume the taboo privileges of his father, although in some instances in the past they were made to inure to such offspring, notably in the case of Umi, king of Hawaii. Before an 
Ali Naupio, clothed with the supreme function of the tabu moe, all with the exception of tabu chiefs, were compelled to prostrate themselves. When he appeared, or was approaching, his rank was announced by an attendant, and all not exempt from the homage were required to drop with their faces to the earth. The exemptions were the Ali Pio, the Ali Naha, the Ali Wohi, and the Lo Ali. They, and they alone, were permitted to stand in the presence of a Niaupio chief. The Ali Pio was also a sacred chief, so much so that he conversed with others only in the night time, and on chiefesses of that rank the sun was not allowed to shine. The kings lived in affluence in large mansions of wood or stone, in the midst of walled grounds adorned with fruit and shade trees and other attractive forms of vegetation. The grounds also contained many other small buildings for the accommodation of guests, retainers, attendants, servants and guards. They were attended by their high priests, civil and military advisers, and a retinue of favourite chiefs, and spent their time, when not employed in war or affairs of state, in indolent and dignified repose. The personal attendants of an ancient Hawaiian king were all of noble blood, and each had his specified duty. They were known as Kahu Ali, or guardians of the person of the king. They consisted of Iwikuamu, or robber of the person, the Ipukuha, or spittoon bearer, the pa kahili, or kahili bearer, the kaipu'u, or sleep watcher, and the aipu'upu'u, or steward. Other inferior chiefs called pu'uku, with messengers, spies, executioners, prophets, astrologers, poets, historians, musicians, and dancers were among his retainers. Connected with the palace was an apartment used as a hayao, or chapel, which was sometimes in charge of the high priest. During festival seasons, brilliant feasts, tournaments, and hula, and musical entertainments were given in the royal grounds, and the court was splendid in displays of flowers, feathers, and other gaudy trappings. The king not unfrequently took part in the manly games and exercises of the chiefs, and sometimes complimented the hula dancers and musicians by joining in their performances. To render the kings and higher nobility still more exclusive, they had a court language which was understood only by themselves, and which was changed in part from time to time as its expressions found interpretation beyond the royal circle. Some portions of this court language have been preserved. Arts, Habits and Customs all implements of war or industry known to early Hawaiians were made either of wood, stone, or bone, as the islands are destitute of metals. But with these rude helps, they laid up hewn stone walls, felled trees, made canoes and barges, manufactured cloths and cordage, fashioned weapons, constructed dwellings and temples, roads and fish ponds, and tilled the soil. They had axes, adzes, and hammers of stone, spades of wood, knives of flint and ivory, needles of thorn and bone, and spears and daggers of hardened wood. They wove mats for sails and other purposes, and from the inner bark of the paper mulberry tree beat out a fine, thin cloth, called kappa, which they ornamented with colours and figures. Their food was the flesh of swine, dogs and fowls, fish, and almost everything living in the sea, taro, sweet potatoes and yams, and fruits, berries, and edible seaweed of various kinds. Poi, the favorite food of all classes, was a slightly fermented paste made of cooked and pounded taro, a large bulbous root in taste resembling an Indian turnip. They made a stupefying beverage by chewing the awa root, and from the sweet root of the tea plant, fermented an intoxicating drink. The soft parts of the sugar cane were eaten, but with the exception of the manufacture of a beer called Uiuia, no other use seems to have been made of it. Their food, wrapped in tea leaves, was usually cooked in heated and covered pits in the earth. Their household vessels were shells, gourd calabashes of various shapes and sizes, 
and platters and other containers made of wood. The dress of the ancient Hawaiian was scant, simple, and cool. The principal, and generally the only, garment of the male was the maro, a narrow cloth fastened around the loins. To this was sometimes added, among the masses, a kihai, or cloth thrown loosely over the shoulders. The females wore a pau, or skirt of invariably five thicknesses of kappa, fastened around the waist and extending to the knees. When the weather was cool, a short mantle was sometimes added. Ordinarily, the heads of both sexes were without coverings, and in rare instances, they wore kamas, or sandals of tea, or pandanus leaves. With the maro, which was common to the males of all ranks, the king on state occasions wore the royal mamo, a mantle reaching to the ankles and made of the yellow feathers of a little sea bird called the mamo. When it is mentioned that but a single yellow feather is found under each wing of the mamo, and that tens of thousands, perhaps, entered into the fabrication of a single mantle, some idea of the value of such a garment may be gathered. A few of these royal cloaks are still in existence, one of which was worn by King Kalakaua during the ceremonies of his late coronation. Pure yellow was the royal colour. The shorter capes or mantles of the chiefs were of yellow feathers mixed with red. The colour of the priests and gods was red. The ornaments of the nobility consisted of headdresses of feathers, palaoas, or charms of bone, suspended from the neck, and necklaces and bracelets of shells, teeth, and other materials. Many of them were tattooed on the face, thighs, and breasts, but the practice was not universal. Flowers were in general use as ornaments, and at feasts, festivals, and other gatherings, garlands of fragrant leaves and blossoms crowned the heads and encircled the necks of all. This is among the beautiful customs still retained by the Hawaiians. The dwellings of the masses were constructed of upright posts planted in the ground, with cross beams and rafters, and roofs and sides of woven twigs and branches thatched with leaves. The houses of the nobility were larger, stronger, and more pretentious, and were frequently surrounded by broad verandas. It was a custom to locate dwellings so that the main entrance would face the east, the home of Kane. The opposite entrance looked towards Kahiki, the land from which Wakea came. The homes of well-conditioned Hawaiians consisted of no less than six separate dwellings or apartments. First, the Hayao, or idle house. Second, the Moa, or eating house of the males, which females were not allowed to enter. Third, the Hale Noa, the house of the women, which men could not enter. Fourth, the Hale Aina, or eating house of the wife. Fifth, the Kua, or wife's working house. The sixth, the Halepea, or retiring house, or nursery of the wife. The poorer classes followed these regulations so far as their means would admit, but screens usually took the place of separate dwellings or definite apartments. When war was declared or invasion threatened, messengers called Luna Pays were dispatched by the king to his subject chiefs, who promptly responded in warriors, canoes, or whatever else was demanded. A regular line of battle consisted of a centre and right and left wings, and marked military genius was sometimes displayed in the handling of armies. Sea battles, where hundreds, sometimes thousands, of war canoes met in hostile shock, were common and usually resulted in great loss of life. Truces and terms of peace were ordinarily respected, but few prisoners were spared, except for sacrifice. The weapons of the islanders were spears, about twenty feet in length, javelins, war clubs, stone axes, rude halberds, knives, daggers, and slings. The slings were made either of cocoa fibre or human hair. The stones thrown were sometimes a pound or more in weight, and were delivered with great force and accuracy. The spears were sometimes thrown, while the javelins were reserved for closer encounter. Shields were unknown. Hostile missiles were either dodged, caught in the hands, or dexterously warded. The chiefs frequently wore feather helmets in battle, but the person was without protection. 
The athletic sports and games of the people were numerous. The muscular pastimes consisted in part of contests in running, jumping, boxing, wrestling, swimming, diving, canoe racing, and surf riding. Rolling round stone discs and throwing darts along a prepared channel was a favorite sport. But the most exciting was the holua contest, in which two or more might engage. On long, light, and narrow sledges, the contestants, lying prone, dashed down along the steep declivities, the victory being with the one who first reached the bottom. The goddess Pele enjoyed the game and frequently engaged in it, but she was a dangerous contestant. On being beaten by Kahavari, a chief of Puna, she drove him from the district with a stream of lava. Sham battles and spear and stone throwing were also popular exercises. Among the indoor games were Konani, Kilu, Pune Henehene, Puni Piki, and Hiwa. Konane resembled the English game of drafts. Puhunehene consisted of the adroit hiding by one of the players of a small object under one of several mats in the midst of the party of contestants, and the designation of its place of concealment by the others. Kilu was a game somewhat similar, accompanied by singing. Punipiki was something like the game of fox and geese, and Hiwa was played on a board with four squares. These were the most ancient of Hawaiian household games. The musical instruments of the islanders were few and simple. They consisted of pahus, or drums, of various sizes, the ohe, or bamboo flute, the hokio, a rude clarionet, a nasal flageolet, and a reed instrument played by the aid of the voice. To these were added, on special occasions, castanets and dry gourds containing pebbles, which were used to mark the time of chants and other music. They had many varieties of dances or hulas, all of which were more or less graceful, and a few of which were coarse and licentious. Bands of hula dances, male and female, were among the retainers of the Moys and prominent chiefs, and their services were required on every festive occasion. The mourning customs of the people were peculiar. For days they wailed and feasted together over a dead relative or friend, frequently knocking out one or more teeth, shaving portions of their heads and beards, and tearing their flesh and clothes. But their wildest displays of grief were on the death of the kings and governing chiefs. During a royal mourning season, which sometimes continued for weeks, the people indulged in an unrestrained saturnalia of recklessness and license. Every law was openly violated, every conceivable crime committed. The excuse was, and the authorities were compelled to accept it, that grief had temporarily unseated the popular reason, and they were not responsible for their misdemeanors. The masses buried their dead or deposited the bodies in caves, but the bones of the kings were otherwise disposed of. There were royal burial places, one at Honaunau on the island of Hawaii, and another called Iao on Maui, and the tombs of many of the ancient Moi and ruling chiefs were in one or the other of those sacred spots, but they probably contained but few royal bones. In the fear that the bones of the Moys and distinguished chiefs might fall into the hands of their enemies and be used for fish hooks, arrow points, for shooting mice, and other debasing purposes, they were usually destroyed or hidden. Some were weighted and thrown into the sea, and others, after the flesh had been removed from them and burned, were secreted in mountain caves. The hearts of the kings of the island of Hawaii were frequently thrown into the crater of Kilauea as an offering to Pele. The bones of the first Kamehameha were so well secreted in some cave in Kona that they have not yet been found. And the bones of Kuali, a celebrated Oahuan king of the 17th century, were reduced to powder, mingled with poi, and the funeral feast fed to a hundred unsuspecting chiefs. The ancient Hawaiians divided the year into 12 months of 30 days each. The days of the month were named, not numbered. As this gave but 360 days to their year, they added and gave to their god Lono, in feasting and festivity, 
the number of days required to complete the sidereal year, which was regulated by the rising of the Pleiades. The new year began with the winter solstice. They also reckoned by lunar months in the regulation of their monthly feasts. The year was divided into two seasons, the rainy and the dry, and the day into three general parts, morning, noon, and night. The first, middle, and after parts of the night were also designated. As elsewhere mentioned, they had names for the five principal planets, which were called the wandering stars, and for a number of heavenly groups and constellations. It was this knowledge of the heavens that enabled them to navigate the ocean in their frail canoes. In counting, the Hawaiians reckoned by fours and their multiples. Their highest expressed number was 400,000. More than that was indefinite. After what has been written, it would seem scarcely necessary to mention that the Hawaiians were not cannibals. Their legends refer to two or three instances of cannibalism on the islands, but the man-eaters were natives of some other group and did not long survive. The Hawaii of today. With this somewhat extended reference to the past of the Hawaiian Islands and their people, it is deemed that a brief allusion to their present political, social, industrial and commercial condition will not be out of place. The legends presented leave the simple but warlike islanders standing naked but not ashamed in the light of civilization suddenly flashed upon them from across the seas. In the darkness behind them are legends and spears. In the light before them are history and law. Let us see what the years since have done for them. The Hawaiian government of today is a mild constitutional monarchy. The ruling family claiming descent from the most ancient and respected of the chiefly blood of Hawaii. The departments of the government are legislative, executive and judicial. The Legislative Assembly, which meets every two years, consists of representatives chosen by the people, nobles named by the Sovereign, and Crown Ministers. They act in a single body, choosing their presiding officer by ballot, and their proceedings are held jointly in the English and Hawaiian languages, and in both are their laws and proceedings published. As the elective franchise is confined to native and naturalized citizens, the most of the representatives chosen by the people are natives, all of whom are more or less educated, and many of whom are graceful and eloquent debaters. White representatives of accepted sympathy with the natives are occasionally elected, and a majority of the nobles and ministers are white men. The English common law is the basis of their statutes, and their civil and criminal codes are not unlike our own. The legislature fixes taxes, excise and customs charges and provides by appropriation for all public expenditure. The representatives are paid small salaries and the legislature is formally convened and prorogued by the king in person. Although the present sovereign was elected by the legislature for the reason heretofore mentioned, the naming of a successor is left to the occupant of the throne. The king is provided at public expense with a palace and royal guard, and appropriations of money amounting to perhaps $40,000 yearly. He has also some additional income from what are known as crown lands. The two sisters of the king and the daughter of one of them receive from the treasury an aggregate of $15,500 yearly. The king entertains liberally, is generous with his friends and attendants, and probably finds his income no more than sufficient to meet his wants from year to year. His advisers are four ministers of state and a privy council. The ministry is composed of a minister of foreign affairs who ranks as premier, minister of finance, minister of interior and attorney general. The privy council is composed of 30 or 40 leading citizens appointed by the crown. In certain matters they have original and exclusive powers. They are convened in council from time to time, but receive no compensation. The most of the privy councillors are white men and embrace almost every nationality. The majority of the ministers of state are usually white men of ability, and their salaries are $6,000 per annum each. The judiciary is composed of a Supreme Court of three members, 
one of whom is Chief Justice and Chancellor. Circuit courts hold on in different districts and minor magistrates courts in localities where they are required. The Supreme and Circuit Judges are all white men, and but few magistrates are natives. The salaries of the Superior Judges are respectable, and the most of them are men of ability. The laws, as a rule, are intelligently administered and promptly executed, and life and property are amply protected. Public schools are numerous throughout the islands, and are largely attended by native children. A considerable proportion of the adult natives are able to read and write their own language, and a number of native newspapers and periodicals are sustained. The English press of Honolulu, the only point of publication, is respectable in ability and enterprise. Leprosy was brought to the islands by the Chinese about 40 years ago, and has become a dangerous and loathsome scourge. Lepers are seldom encountered, however, as they are removed, whenever discovered, to the island of Molokai, where they are humanely cared for by the government. It is a cureless but painless affliction, and is doubtless contagious under certain conditions. Nine-tenths or more of the lepers are either natives or Chinese, and the whole number amounts to perhaps 1,200. It is not thought that the malady is increasing, and it is hoped that a careful segregation of the afflicted will in time eradicate the disease from the group. The commerce of the islands is largely in the hands of foreigners, and the sugar plantations are almost exclusively under their control. There are but few native merchants, the large dealers being Americans, Germans, English and French, while the smaller traders are generally Portuguese and Chinese. There are native lawyers, clerks, mechanics, magistrates, and policemen, but the most of the race who are compelled to labor for their support find employment as farm and plantation laborers, stevedores, sailors, coachmen, boatmen, fishermen, gardeners, fruit peddlers, waiters, soldiers, and house servants, in all of which capacities they are generally industrious, cheerful, and honest. The products of the islands for export are sugar, molasses, rice, bananas, fungus, hides, and wool, of an aggregate approximate value of $8 million annually. The principal product, however, is sugar, amounting to perhaps 100,000 tons yearly. Nine-tenths of the exports of the group find a market in the United States, and four-fifths or more of the imports in value are from the Great Republic. The receipts and expenditures of the government are a little less than $1,500,000 annually, derived principally from customs duties and direct taxation. The population of the islands is a little more than 80,000, of which about 45,000 are natives. The Americans, English, Germans, Norwegians and French number perhaps 10,000, and Chinese, Japanese and Portuguese from the Azores constitute the most of the remainder. The postal facilities of the islands are ample and reliable. Inter-island steamers, of which there are many, convey the mails throughout the group at regular intervals, and the San Franciscan and Australian steamers afford a punctual and trustworthy service with the rest of the world. The islands have a postal money order system reaching within and beyond their boundaries, and are connected with the Universal Postal Union. Over 20,000 of the inhabitants of the group are centred in Honolulu, the capital of the kingdom, and its beautiful and dreamy suburb of Waikiki. The business portions of the city, with their macadamized and lighted streets and blocks of brick and stone buildings, have a thrifty and permanent appearance, while the eastern suburbs, approaching the hills with a gentle ascent, abound in charming residences, embowered in palms. Small mountain streams run through the city and afford an abundant supply of sweet water, which is further augmented by a number of flowing artesian wells. With a temperature ranging from 70 to 90 degrees, Honolulu, with its substantial churches and public buildings, its air of affluence and dreamy quiet, is a delightful place of residence to those who enjoy the heat and languor of the tropics. In the midst of these evidences of prosperity and advancement 
It is but too apparent that the natives are steadily decreasing in numbers and gradually losing their hold upon the fair land of their fathers. Within a century, they have dwindled from 400,000 healthy and happy children of nature without care and without want to a little more than a tenth of that number of landless, hopeless victims to the greed and vices of civilization. They are slowly sinking under the restraints and burdens of their surroundings and will, in time, succumb to social and political conditions foreign to their natures and poisonous to their blood. Year by year their footprints will grow more dim along the sands of their reef-sheltered shores, and fainter and fainter will come their simple songs from the shadows of the palms, until finally their voices will be heard no more for ever. And then, if not before, and no human effort can shape it otherwise, the Hawaiian Islands, with the echoes of their songs and the sweets of their green fields, will pass into the political, as they are now firmly within the commercial, system of the great American Republic. February 1887 edited and produced by D.B. Spitzer in Badger Strip Studios in Portland, Oregon. You can contact us at pgttcm.com, on Facebook at Black Clock Audio Tales, and just look for us, Black Clock Audio Tales. Thank you.